Welcome to another edition of Fragments of Rock. Now, in this edition, I've unearthed a gem which I didn't know I had. Um, well, I, I'd undervalued it, let's put it that way. Hadn't I, Mark? Yeah, I was on Listen to Six Music, avid fan as we are, and um, a new film's out uh, called The Sparks Brothers. And I said to you, have you ever interviewed The Sparks? And you went, I don't think so. And then, <laughs> a, then a few hours later, you said, oh, I have. <laughs> Yeah, I, I didn't know I kept the interview, that was the thing. What happened was, we were going back to April 1974, and we were, we were aware in the, in the extravaganza office at Radio Nottingham of an, al of an album, Imminent, and a group on tour who were really cutting new, new, well, new trends in music and in visual, and in visual accomplishment on the stage. And the, the band was called Sparks. Uh, I think they were appearing somewhere like Left, Left Loughborough or Leicester. They were on tour. And their single had just been released by Island Records, who were keen to get it into the top 40. So what happened was Island got in touch with me and said, Sparks ready around the corner. Would you like to interview them? Well, I'd heard the single, even though it hadn't charted, I'd heard it, and I thought, oh, not half, because I'd heard so much about them. So they brought them into the studio. I did the interview with Ron and Russell and put it out, thought nothing of it, until I got a phone call later that week from Radio One, Rock Speak, Radio One. Um, we understand you have an interview with Ron and Russell Mail, Sparks. I said, yes. So do you realise it's the only one in the country and they've just entered the charts and we need it. Can we have it for tonight's transmission? So I said, yes. And the result is here. Uh, Sparks have entered the charts this week uh, with their single. This town ain't uh, big enough for both of us. And they were in Nottingham a few days ago, and the uh, two brothers and leaders of Sparks, Russ and Ron Mayle, talked to BBC Radio Nottingham producer Ron Holmes. Uh, we'll be previewing the new Sparks album in a few moments, but first, here's that single. Well, that's this town big enough for the both of us, so your latest single, which is also your first on Ireland, with your new producer, Muff Winwood. We'll talk about the band in just a few moments, but uh, first of all, that single, can you explain what it's all about? Basically, most situations and most people are, are, you'll have to admit, a bit on the boring side, like all of us. So the way that, that a person is, is able to cope with this in a lot of situations is to kind of make more out of things that are actually there. So what is actually happening in this song is Russell, the singer, is living just tedious, everyday situations and then kind of magnifying them into a into a kind of a movie sort of uh, situation at different times just to kind of make everything interesting for himself. And he always reverts back to the to the situation. This town ain't big enough for the both of us is sort of a grand uh, illustration of his little his little tiny predicaments that he has uh, in visions he's an American pilot bombing Hiroshima and uh, and then he reverts back to his little situation of this town ain't big enough for both of us, which sort of sums up each of his little, little uh, dreamlike fantasies that he has. Actually, the truth of it is that those are the only words that would fit that long a gap in the song. Actually, it's not about any of that at all. <laughs> it's very interesting hearing you talk, uh, Russell, because um, you when, you, when one hears accent. you sing... Yeah, you've got a funny accent. When, Thank when, you very much. When, when one hears you sing, you've got a very high voice often. Yes. I, I've always looked at your photograph and thought, now this voice doesn't fit the face. It doesn't. But, oh. but your voice now does. What, why all this falsetto stuff? Well, um, actually, I sing that way because the songs are written that way. Ronnie writes most of the songs without any sort of regard to whether they can, uh, whether it's humanly possible for them to be sung. He writes them mostly on the piano without actually singing them, so the melody line is played on the piano and he'll oftentimes jump from octave to octave without any regard for whether anyone can sing the song, and then I'm required to step in and uh, do a little bit of vocal acrobatics. And, and it just happens that uh, half the time the songs are incredibly high, and we don't bother with things like transposing them into, into keys, which make it a lot easier to sing. We just leave it, whatever it is, we leave it, and I sing it. And, and so he likes, likes playing up on the... The right hand. Yeah, I'm not half so good with my left hand. So anytime I get any sort of facility with my left hand, we're going to have a very 
uh, basso profundo on, on your hands. <laughs> well, Excuse the expression. Let's uh, move away from your current music at the moment and let's just talk about, say, the two sparks, the American and the British. I suppose it's fair to say you're the centre of the fire of sparks, but uh, what's become of the US sparks? Oh, uh, I don't know. They don't write us any letters anymore, so it's hard to know what they're doing. I don't We've know. heard all sorts of nasty rumours, but... Uh, why did you split with them in the end? Well, actually, um, it wasn't a formal sort of split. We're still the best of friends. We just felt it was the right time to change all of the, the outside elements um, surrounding the two of us. We felt it was time to experiment and see what would happen with us, us performing with three other musicians and having a totally different environment moving to England having a totally new record company, having a, a new manager, a, a new, new agency. new pair of socks. A new pair of socks, a new pair of underpants as well. And just seeing what would happen if we changed all the al elements around us and the one thing not changing, however, just the music being exactly the same, the same songs, same songwriter and the same singing but changing all the other elements. Having changed these elements, what's your response to the result? It's very groovy now. We're, uh, oh, we're very happy with, uh, with the, new, uh, the new sparks. You haven't just moved to this country because perhaps you think it's easier to get on in Britain than it is in America. Oh, no, quite the opposite. It's impossible to get on here because we're always freezing to death every, every day. And uh, maybe it's working to our advantage, however, because it, it confines us to our... To our uh, centrally heated flat and uh, we have to we have to just sit there and uh, it just... really is a fact though that, what, that the, one of the reasons that that British bands are better is because in Los Angeles you'd be a fool to be in a band when you can be outside in the sun and, and just kind of uh, laying flat on your back whereas here you don't have too much of a choice you can either be inside trying to, to do something musically or outside getting very wet and cold. So, Since we've been here, he's, you, take a look at his hands. If you could oh. see this in... in uh, are, these, are these the hands? On the, color television, hands. you would see fingers swollen to approximately three times their normal size. He's got chill blains. See, just that really That's why I'm sitting on my they hands are. at the very <laughs> moment. Yeah. They are very swollen. Yeah. yeah. Slightly purple as well. Yeah. yeah. That's probably another reason why the songs are coming out a bit peculiar now, because his fingers have... Uh, a lot of keys are very, very painful for me to play in, and so I have to... In a way, in you haven't really answered my question. Oh, what was the question? Was really, the question was, <laughs> did you think it would be easier to make it in Britain than in America? Oh, well, um, I don't know. We're hoping that it will be, uh, that it won't prove to be a big obstacle making it here. We're just, uh, the environment seems a lot more right for our type of music because we enjoy not just playing songs we enjoy the whole aura of a band that has a, an image and we enjoy the th the trappings that surround pop music and all we don't just enjoy blowing or the purpose of rock in the states is is to have a good time and we really dislike good times um, there's too many good time bands about uh, we just enjoy uh, but you do enjoy yourselves on stage. I mean, this is blatantly obvious. Oh yeah, it's just it's just the sort of the concept of a good time as as a religion. Like uh, I enjoy a good time as I'm Catholic. Uh, that that sort of thing. I don't think it should be a, a special cause to to have have a good time. That that sort of thing. I mean, we we have as much fun as the next guy probably. <laughs> the question you must always be asked. Uh, Ron, with that moustache, do you like Charlie Chaplin? Charlie who? Charlie Chaplin. Oh. I don't know. He's in 10 years after. Oh, I don't know. Oh. Um, no, I'm not, so, I'm not too familiar with Th There's rumors that Chaplin wants to make a new film. You're not thinking of uh, getting in on that part. Oh, well, actually, what the, we were approached. We appeared on an American television show called American Bandstand, and uh, an agent of Charlie Chaplin had had seen us at the time, and so there's some possibility of something going on along those lines. This isn't such a crazy question because, of course, you were involved in films, even from what you were the what the advertising answer to the Osmonds many years ago. Yeah, um, many years ago, we uh, we did a lot of fashion modeling uh, and television commercials. Uh, 
modeling clothing and and uh, advertising hamburgers. We would hold a hamburger and and uh, munch it. What would you say when you were munching the hamburger? I'd say this is McDonald's, the quarter pound all beef hamburger, forty nine cents at your local McDonald's drive through. That's actually our favorite kind of music, the kind of music that's used with those sort of adverts, stuff that's really short and to the point and uh, really sprightly. One thing <clears throat> I'd like to talk about producers. You've had Todd Rundgren as your producer. Now, of course, that was in the early days, even for Todd. What's he like as a person to work with? Uh, he's kind of boring. I don't know. His girlfriend was really nice, yeah. and I stole her, stole her from him. <laughs> And now uh, Todd doesn't talk to us much, but she was all right. Um, yeah, he's a he's a guy, just like just like you or I. What a, what about I was bringing it right up to date? Muff Winwood. Now um, you've got the new British band behind you, and uh, to me it sounds far more dynamic. What is it? Is it the musician? Is it Muff Winwood or what? Well, you just you it's have to life. kind of play fast to keep warm here, and that, that's the main thing in Los Angeles, where the the first two albums were recorded. There was no special inducement to playing fast. And here, if if you want your fingers to stay reasonably warm, you have to keep them moving. That's the only explanation I can think of. Did you follow Sparks then later on in the career at all? <laughs> I just I was just fascinated by them. You, you can't be fascinated by a, 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 their first album as a picture of not on them on the front like that. I mean, I've been following them ever since. I've got loads of their albums here. But, you know, they were just they were just so entertaining. They were just so engaging. You just can't fail to go wrong. And you knew that whatever questions you asked, they, they would have either parried them or answered them. I mean, like um, the Charlie Chaplin thing, it makes me laugh every time I hear it. Charlie, do it. <laughs> yeah, they're quite, they're quite sort of candid, but sort of cagey. And yeah, just, uh, yeah, yeah, just came across as really nice people as well, actually. Yeah, they, I thought they were. They were really charming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it was an easy interview to do. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'll say. And the most important, I saved it. <laughs> saved it, yeah, in the records, in the records. So I'm very uh, proud of it because radio, to get something on Radio 1 in those days was something else. It was really prestigious. So I felt really important for a time. Yeah. And it's been in the it's been in the garage for, for how many years? How long that went? So that has not been played for nearly, well, I'm 51, so what, 1974, did you say? Yeah, 1974. Yeah, so it's, it's, I've, never, I've never listened to it again. It went out, I, I heard it on Radio 1, um, recorded it on Radio 1 as well, and that's the last I remember of it. Yeah. And wait, wait, so we'll have one look at that tape again. <laughs> there it is. There it is. <laughs> great, great. Right. Cool. Don't forget, we're always interested in your comments. If you want to leave them below, we'd be delighted to hear from you. And if I can, I'll answer the questions. Meanwhile, I look forward to seeing the film. Get to see it. Can't wait. And stand by for more Fragments of Rock in the very near future.